Brian O'Driscoll on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. So, I think it's fair to say the opening round of the Six Nations has set us up very nicely indeed for round two. Ireland and France with bonus points apiece, top of the table. They will meet in Paris Saturday evening. The Scots, fresh from their Calcutta Cup win, travel to Cardiff, which will be a very interesting litmus test. And then England, disappointing in Murrayfield, will play Italy on the Sunday. Brian O'Driscoll is in studio. You're very welcome. Joe, good to see you in the flesh. Just been the two years, I think. <laughs> You lost weight? No, absolutely not. <laughs> the one man has lost weight through COVID. Yeah. So um, we were talking last night with Liam Toland and Jerry Thornley, and I think everybody's just very buoyed by the Irish team picking up right where they left off after November. I mean, November was a very pleasant surprise, the mm. extent of it in November, and then first two minutes against Wales, and you're kind of thinking, wow, this team are really feeling it right now. Yeah, they are. They're, they're, they've clicked. Um, confidence is high. Um, I think we we knew that the England performance from the end of last year's Six Nations wasn't a flash in the pan, particularly whatever about after the Japanese game, because I think you have to, with the greatest respect, you have to look at the opposition. But when it happened against New Zealand and then not quite the same standard of performance against Argentina, but still very good, excellent shape, very you know, great clarity, um, direction defensively very solid so all the kind of hallmarks of really good performances built on top of one another um, and then again the, you know they're attacking th both sides the, the defence was was excellent too I think Wales were blunt at times but I think huge credit to Ireland's defensive spacing system um, aggressive trying to get through the tackle do more than their th their own job and plugging inside I just thought it was a very very good performance it would have been another 15 points if conditions were a bit better that was the disparity between the two teams so for you this is a simple question I'm sure with a complicated answer why is Ireland's attack now looking so great um, I think you know it, it took a long while for it to click it was very hard to see wh what that was what they were trying to do mm. I remember you saying no pattern here a few times or I, I couldn't no see game it plan. I couldn't really see it and um, and I was wondering whether I was getting further disconnected from the game but I, I think other coaches other people you know that, that have come from the game were struggling to see it too and then I think you know you win some collisions um, and then you get your lines of running and that's been the big point of difference I did a piece for ITV before the game of the evolution of their game plan over the course of last year's Six Nations and sometimes it's a bit smoke and mirrory when you're you know doing TV that you find the clips that suit the narrative that you're telling but but it, it did become quite evident that over the course of um, the championship, that um, you know the pod that they're playing, you know the the three with the guy in behind hitting the middle guy, the aggression with which the ball carrier was taking it to the line improved as things went on. Um, Johnny probably was a little bit better as the tournament went on, rounding around the corner when he did get it. Um, but then the two forwards that ran lines off him. Um, we're running with intent, running into space. Um, much easier to do when you've got someone to run off. And, I, and I'll and i come to that a little bit, the difference between what I saw between Johnny and Joey at the at the weekend. Um, but everyone is a viable option. Mm. There's no, like, the decoy thing is gone. And um, and it's it's the timing of runs. It's knowing, it's like a, tr like a sprinter trying to get off the B of the bang. It's trying to time when you're meant to be in the hole or in the space you're trying to get to. And if you go too early, it's no good. A bit like a sprint, you know? Later is better. And because what happens with late is that you run with intent. You feel you're behind. So you run harder. And what does running harder look like to the opposition? Like you want to get the ball. And every time someone runs hard with hands up looking to get the ball and they're a viable option, it defences have to respect it and then they have to make decisions sometimes it's going to be the, the front line sometimes it's going to be out the back and the further out the line the defensive line you get the more challenging that becomes mm. because your decision time lessens and lessens you said an interesting thing there that the the decoy line is gone i do remember talking to you when you first retired and one of the big mantras was well if you're the decoy line you have to really animate and look like you might get the ball and now listening to you we're talking about a team where i really might get the ball 
I've but, got to be ready for it. But well, listen, players, you know, back, you know, in the early days of when I was playing, not just towards the end. Mm. Your good tens were able to throw eyes out the back and, and dish off the front ball, and if you weren't ready for it, you get a you know a proper rollicking at training or in, usually happened to training. Sometimes happened in games, so you got to always be ready for it. But it's it's not it's understanding the role of what you're doing of running in and not just crowding a space, but running and modifying your line depending on what the ball carrier is doing. So in the instance of so our two best ball carriers in that first pod are Tyg Furlong and Caelan Doris. The two of them run with the same intent as if they're carrying themselves as when they throw the ball out the back. And obviously they're, they have an, a rugby playing ability to see what the defence is doing in front of them. If a defender steps in from outside, they can do that little tip on to whoever's running short. Or if there's a dog leg you know, and the defence on the inside is slow to come off the line, they can tip it in to whoever's running that line. But what they both do is they carry with intent, they stay square to the line, they don't have to look around the corner. You know, you see other players, you know, Porter, um, Kean Healy, they're not comfortable throwing blind passes. The whole working of this system is on blind pass throwing and knowing, throwing it to space rather than to the man. And we saw that one with, with Sexton around the corner. Then what he's doing before, sorry, just, just before you, you kind of follow up, yeah. he squares around the corner then and whoever's running outside him, sometimes forward, sometimes a back, is then re realising he's squaring the next defender, so he has to be in the space outside that. And that's their role. And sometimes Darius is brilliant at doing. He realises that Johnny's running across and he stays wider, and then he straightens up and then he runs tighter to him. Mm. And what he does, he sucks in other defenders where there's uncertainty on the inside, there's definitely uncertainty outside. So it's just a matter of tr then trying to pick the right option. Mm. Be a viable option no matter what, and then try and see where you won't get a clean break every time, but you'll get a soft shoulder, and that's where the offload game comes thereafter. Yes. See, I knew it would be a complicated answer to a simple question because it takes all these different ingredients. So in effect, we have this brilliant framework, and we have lots of timing going on and lots of intent, and it means the man in possession at any one point has different options yeah. and the defence know that man in possession has different options so that's not a good place for defence to be it's not I, but I, I suppose in that position it depends on the personnel that are in there and some do it better than others Johnny is the best Gary's really improved holding that pass to the last second it's that slight delay and we're talking hundreds of a second okay. of committing a defence or just getting someone's shoulders turned in or getting them to sit for hundreds of a second longer than they feel comfortable with doing mm. um, and um, I would say Hugo's getting good at it um, and yeah I, I think it's probably is it is there any um, realize, uh, uh, you know, there's probably no coincidence that those guys are the best at it because I think they've been at it the longest. That they've been playing a strong version of this at Leinster, mm. you know, and it's elaborate on a strong version of this. At Leinster. It's very close, you yeah. know. This, I think, the the concept is very, very similar of what they're trying to achieve. To me, that makes a lot of sense. Why wouldn't if you've got the bulk supplier who also happened to be one of the best sides consistently in Europe and they're doing lots of great things? Even if you were trying not to incorporate a bunch of it, it would happen anyway. So why not embrace it a little bit? But also, it's the cycle of international rugby, particularly in our on our island, where whoever has the lion's share of the players tends to go with their style, mm. unless there's a very forceful individual within that that's dictating um, play. And when you look at the All Black game, 12 start Leinster starters, there's lots of them. But also the fact that they're having huge success with it. It's yeah. very. It's not difficult to get others on side with this. Yeah. By the way, we're carving teams up. Do you want in on this? Yeah. And watch. And and now all the more like whatever scepticism they may have had over the course of the last two years has been eradicated because now, with with multiple options being chosen at at every play. You, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, the defence sure doesn't. Yes. And is it as direct almost as, uh, remember that one we did in Bath a couple of weeks ago? Let's do that here. Um, yeah, and listen, they have their own calls. And, and I'm not saying it's identical, but it's very, very similar. Okay. And um, But then, you know, you throw into the mix someone that's able to call um, 
you know, the the first try is a great example of it. They do a six plus one line out, which means Josh van der Fleer is in the nine position. They're using him a lot. They use him from two purposes because he's got good acceleration. He can get into the seam of the 10-12 himself. He's a much improved passer. He had the most carries as well, so they are using him plenty. But also what they use him for is they then use him to get the width. So all of a sudden he's playing nine, Gibson Park's playing ten, and so they okay. play and okay. so they, they can immediately get yeah. further width. So but you and then also you've got to respect the drive too. So and the way referees are refereeing the line out now, they're holding their hands up much longer. So you have an ability to be able to drive for a couple of metres, do a dummy drive, try and suck in the, any would-be defenders that might think that this is mall time, mm. break out, and then with van der Flea's ability to get into that seam or Doris running that short line as what happened in the first try. And then it's just a case of, of holding on to possession. But, but the play before... Um, or the, the the final play, there it's it's Sexton and Mac Hansen yeah. and someone else, I think on that right hand side maybe it's Ringrose, and all of a sudden he he looks up Sexton looks up and realises they've overfolded and he just tells the lads that have been at the previous ruck to stand up and that they're going to do a loop play of some sort. He gets out the back and then he squares it up beautifully commits the inside, Doris runs a great line, commits the next man, Hansen works hard around the outside. Um, Hugo Keenan's not on, on that side, his ring rose. Hugo Keenan comes out of the rook and makes himself the extra man, which he does so often, it is unbelievable. He creates, he makes himself the extra man, meaning the, the overlap so, so often. Him and Larmer for an answer, but him in particular, and right. I think that's what people aren't probably aware of, of that level of work rate. Well, I was just going to say, a lot of us would miss those subtleties. You know, you, you say there's Sexton's ability to spot the opportunity. That's still a cut above most. Oh, like it's honestly, I think he's getting better. Yeah. I really, well, do his think brain he's would be better. getting better. It is getting better. Yeah, yeah. It is. Like, I, I think when I finished up, I, I was, a, I was very frustrated because the body wouldn't do what the brain mm. was thinking and seeing, and I just couldn't react. So you, you do see, you do have clarity, but it does feel as though he's gone to another level. It's, and it is best described as as a, a like a 30 something year old quarterback that's been 15 or 16 years in the NFL that they all of a sudden they've seen every picture yeah. going and they've such clarity in what way they're what they're trying to do mm. and so does their team that if they go okay that option's not good this is better we've more chance we're not going to guarantee to score but we've more chance of getting some success if we do our play correctly on this side versus that side and you can see immediately Josh Adams is pushing lads that are folding around the corner, telling them to stay the side they should. Hansen works hard off his wing. Um, Keenan comes comes out, and that's the reason the miss pass over Bundy happens. If if Keenan doesn't back out there, then Rhys Samet just stays out on Bundy, but he's had to respect the fact that Keenan's backed out. Yes. The miss pass is thrown, and Bundy is a walk-in. It, it's, it's so simple, but it's... It's execution really at its very best at the moment. Okay. And on Sexton's role, so he's obviously still as central as ever, and yet we do see him popping up less as first receiver, and we do see a Mac Hansen coming off his wing and popping up. We see Bundyaki going in as first receiver, ring rose. So he's at the fulcrum of everything, but it feels a lot less like Murray to Sexton, Murray to Sexton, which it, it was for a time. So you might speak to us about Sexton's role. Yeah, I, 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 th I think he'd probably like to be in that <laughs> pivot role as often as he could. Sure. But the reality is, it, you know, sometimes he'll find himself down a blind side and, and it's not worthwhile going that same way again. And it just would take too long um, to, re to, to reshuffle the personnel for him to get in there. So he has to just call a play. And they all know the way they line up is if he does call it late, if he wanted to sweep back late... He doesn't sweep back outside the personnel that are in behind that initial pod. They all push out one. They all realise they want to, you know, save their legs. Okay. So if you have to bust the gut to get, you know, two or three spaces outside of where it would be easier for you to fit in, it means, you know, more graph to get there. Then when you get the ball, will you be best? Will you be a little bit compromised on, you know, on lung burn and on high speed meters and so on? Probably. Whereas so many, you see so often they just 
plug the system and then push one another out. And so there's no one, you know, no one throws toys out of car. I'm here. No. Yes. No, you get outside me. It's like, all oh, right. And the, the likelihood is the further out you go, the more chance you are to throw a, a try scoring pass or be on the receiving end mm-hmm. of a pass that, that could be your score. So it's um, it's just it's very finely tuned at the moment and it's really ticking. And I've been kind of talking about the need for, you know, this evolution don't you know, at, at November you know, for the World Cup, we're going to have to reinvent ourselves. The thing is, this play at the moment, a bit like that Brumby's loop play that's been going for 25 or 30 years, yeah. you know, 10, 12, behind 13 to 10, and with a winger off their shoulder. If you pick the right option, and if 13 does his job sticking the inside defender, it's it's impossible to defend. Well, that is sort of my hope, I suppose, a little bit for the World Cup. I mean, akin to thinking the overlap will go out of fashion in football. If an overlap has worked well down the line, it's an overlap it's a numbers game and it's physics yeah. so the hope would be everything you've said is that there is longevity in this because it is so unpredictable and we're not going to find out halfway through a World Cup year that actually this has suddenly hit the wall and everyone's figured it out yeah I think pr- provided players run with the same intent that they don't become playmakers first they become ball carriers predominantly and then playmaker second because you run with a different intent when you've already got it in your head that I'm going to be a passer here. So they're also trying to play a little bit more off 10. So they have that pod off 10 with, you know, Bundy was sitting in behind it a couple of times, very nearly cut Wales open once or twice where he held on to one, Mm. you know, a bad pass to him wasn't worthwhile to ship on. So there's, there is, all this talk of we're only starting and there's lots of developing to be done it does feel as though there's still scope for improvement which I think is the exciting thing and you know it's the first game of the Six Nations and this will be a very different game against France this weekend but it's um, they must be very pleased themselves with where it's at because it looks you know I, I got a call from a podcast in New Zealand with Jeff Wilson you know um, that that you know, host a lot of the rugby down there, and and they were like, "Oh, can you know, can you come on and talk about Ireland's attack shape? It's really exciting." Wow. It's like, <laughs> I don't, I don't remember if we get that call fifteen years ago. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? So, um, I remember midway through last year as well, uh, talking to you, and so the attack was not working, and you've given a great illustration there of the many components to it now. The other thing was we were saying, well, the attack isn't working. And one of the things which Ireland had been very good at, which was efficiency at the breakdown, had also become sloppy. Maybe we're going back 18 months. Because it does feel like since Paul O'Connell in particular has gone in there, a real disciple of Schmidt, he talks in his book about Munster-Leinster games and not understanding how the hell Leinster are so good at the breakdown. And then when it came to working under Schmidt at Ireland, realising what they were doing, which was so good. It does feel, I don't know what he's doing day to day, but you can almost draw a line breakdown work and this looks to be getting faster and more efficient and a real like focus for the team it's not as exciting to talk about as all the great attacking play but obviously that's going on isn't it I think that's potentially where we beat France at the weekend okay. at the breakdown um, just having analysed us and analysed them I thought they were quite loose there um, originally got a bit of success um, and and if you obviously if you're if you're a ball carrier where you're getting advantage line it makes it easier for your support players to clear that rook but if it's only parity um, I think Ireland have the poachers, have the understanding of when to commit to certain rooks, when to leave other ones alone double efforts, tacklers, getting back on their feet barging, getting up to be the first defender, pushing defences out, getting their spacings. Paul O'Connell's the difference he has made to that Irish rook is something else Okay, and I, I think I told it before that around the World Cup in 2015, he rang me and told me to stop talking about um, Ireland barreling in uh, left barrel, right barrel. I was, I was a, I'm an analyst. I was I was told basically, no, don't do your job. <laughs> You're giving away our secrets yeah, here. Yeah, it was. Like no one else is doing this. Now everyone copped on to it, but I think the and level so, well, of focus now, given what, what, to it. What did you say back to Paul O'Connell? I was like, I won't actually use the terminology barrel. Um, you know, to if that's okay, he goes, that's what it, that's what I don't want to do, and is talking about barrels. I said, fine, I'll call him. But I can continue to earn a living for my family. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, interesting. That so, he's even listening to that stuff and keeping an yeah, ear out. Um, okay. Because I, I remember, 
it was it was one thing that he just used to always stay on top of. I haven't I haven't read Paulie's book, but I I I could understand how he um how he would be obsessive about it because it's it's the game. Well, I, I mean, it's if it, the winning and losing of the game, the battleground. Joe Schmidt's book talks about it being the heartbeat of the game, mm. and you can see that's fed through very in a very real way to O'Connell. Yeah, it's like and. You know, one of the great coaches, one of the great players. You yeah. know, they they know what um, what ca- what matters in games. And it, you know, if you're not a collision winner, you have to ha- be even be more accurate at the rook, mm. because your players don't have as as good a target, as positive a target to clear over. Mm. But it's the even young guys, even Hume at one stage at the weekend when he came on, was running to a rook, wasn't sure about the numbers, and as he ran in and and looked. He realised it was it was it should have been resourced. Now, ironically, it was turned over, but that wasn't his fault on the decision. Just it was inaccurate from the players that were there. But he went in, looked, saw that's not for me, and backpedaled right out and was next lined up for the next phase. Right. So it's it's the understanding of when you're running to it, what the picture looks like. That mm. there's two people there. Occasionally, security, but sometimes the the, the security slows the rook ball down. Now they have a habit of standing over it and then the scrum half has to go in and dig between their legs and that's another half a second. I was do- looking at, you know, in the first 25, 30 minutes, it was nearly 50% of Ireland's rook ball was um, under three seconds. That's kind of Leinster-esque. Okay. And that's the success that they've had. Defences just can't organise. No matter the best defence in the world, can't backpedal and organise and get their spacings and get clarity as to who they're, who they're looking to mark up. You mentioned there, it comes down as well to who wins the collisions. This big French team cheered on by 80,000 atmosphere. Who will win the collisions, do you suspect? That, that's the only worry, isn't it, about Irish teams? And I, I don't think that's going to go away. Um, I think we've we've improved dramatically. I think we've got way more confidence in, in our front row in three really big collision winners. Um, and... You know, you look at Sheen coming on and even Kean Healy, you know, you don't lose a lot by the time he comes on for six, you know, on the 60 minute mark. But, you know, we didn't have that before. And now there's a comfort that comes with that. Um, we're still a s- small bit light in the second row from a, uh, from a ball carrying point of view. But then we've got three good ball carriers in the back row. So it, it, uh, when you come up against the monster teams, mm. France, um, South Africa, England, when they're in their pomp, it, it, it's always going to be a concern. I, d- I don't think that's going to go away. And I presume if you're uh, in the French camp this week, a big focus will be let's tire out this Irish pack because they're bloody good when their tails are up and they're full of energy. Let's get them focused on the trenches and yeah. run at them and Pick and jam, and Pick and jam, and jam around the rook. Okay, make them tackle, tackle, yeah. tackle. Yeah. Tire them out. Yeah, yeah. Tire them out and make them hurt to the scene but that that could play into Ireland's hands as well if they know that they're coming at them and they don't resource that with good numbers you think about someone like Tyg Byrne his technique on on jackling is quite yeah. remarkable will he start or will they want Henderson's beef um i don't know i i, I think it'd be very hard not to play Tyg Byrne i think because of the rook i think that is definitely a card that he he needs to play because we'll have a lot of success there and you know in the past he was guilty of maybe having two or three big moments and very big moments in turnovers but then not being a little bit anonymous thereafter I, I think that hasn't been the case for quite some time now okay. I think he's been very very efficient in the job he's done um, he um, you know, makes his tackles clear. You know, hits his rooks, but also he sniffs ra- around like an ex- that extra back rower, and it, he's he's definitely the best around in the northern hemisphere on it at the moment. Right. It's, it's his ability to actually turn ball over, and the speed of getting it from someone on the ground, and not just trying to latch on and stay in the fight, but actually turn it over and create an attacking opportunity for his side. So, it, I. I do think, though, you know, Antonio, um, Paul Willems, uh, um Aldrich, yeah, they, they're going to go route one. I thought they might play Mofana 
you know, who came on and played really well against Italy when Dante got injured. If, if Dante's fully fit, he, you know, he's a lot to deal with. Yeah. You know, and I just think that they'll they'll fancy themselves of being able to have the ball players in Dupont and Pinot and 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 Tamac, but they need that raw aggression to get them over the advantage line and and get them in behind the defensive system of Ireland to stop them getting firing off the line. So, yeah, it's it's uh, it's an enthralling. Um, yeah, it's all set up. up. It can't not be an interesting game. Uh, meanwhile, Robbie Henshaw is politely clearing his throat and saying, well, I presume I'm back in, coach. Who's Ireland's best player last year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to pick um, a guy from a from a team that's gone well, an individual that's gone well. And Bundy's always played well for us. I think that Robbie offers a little bit more than Bundy. I do, if uh, on a on a close call, but I do think he offers. He's got um, a little bit of a better skill set than him. You know, once or twice Bundy, you know, he passed very well. Once or twice Ireland were away where he just held the pass, and it was fine to do. That's okay to do. You know, if you're in doubt, don't throw it as well. Um, don't pass on crap, but. Um, but I do feel, you know, Robbie was our best player last year and that hasn't gone away. So um, it does feel as though he's, um, he, he is first choice. Remember what he did. He was the man single-handedly that got us back into the tie in Paris two years ago with that solo effort um, where we were kind of playing second fiddle for most of the game and then grabbed the, the game by the scruff of the neck. Um, and and he obviously knows the system extremely well. That's not to take anything from Bundy's performance, but I, I you know, on a fully fit team, are you still are you picking your best players? I think Robbie's you just shades that. Okay. You mentioned at the start of the conversation that you also think Ireland's defence is really good. Now this French attack is scary. Again, eighty thousand tails up going for it. So how equipped is this defence to well, I don't know, what's a good night? One try, two try, three tries conceded? Is that kind of about breaking even with this French side? Yeah, I don't know what the, what our stats look like. They're, I'm sure they're pretty impressive the last, you know, eight or nine games, you know, not conceding a lot. Even the try they conceded against Wales was their own turnover. Yeah. It was, you know, a bad pass that should have just been, shouldn't, an error shouldn't have been compounded. Yeah, it's not a defensive with another. mistake. No, it's not. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about, about it. Um... It's um, yeah, like obviously the the attack that you're, they're dealing with, provided to drive ball, even against Italy, that try that that Villiers, oh, yeah. um, the quick hands, you know, is Dante is that nine twelve behind thirteen quick hands to Pano, but like it was it barely touched both of their palms, and then it was into um, was it Ramos was on at that stage, um, and and then out, out to uh, Villiers who looked pretty hot mm. um, so if it's dry you know you, you've got to respect that they have the ability to do that um, so either way if it's wet and you've got big f- ball carrying forwards we're going to find it grueling if it's dry they have the ability to, to you know pick passes and do the sublime at the moment it's predicted dry great I, I, well I think that'll suit both teams I think okay. we both want to play and um, so what do you think I mean uh, is it, it, it can't not be a long night in the office for the defence. Would you like? Is the advice well? Let's let's just try and hold on to possession and just take the sting out of them that way. Or well, that, that is their game. They want they're a possession based game yeah. team. They're they're comfortable to hold on to it and not like the team of old where they want to go. They went nowhere for twenty, yeah. you know, twenty phases. They they do realise that if they get knocked in a collision. They're not afraid to go to a kick, to a contestable kick, um, to box kick if you have to, but yeah. you see an awful lot less box, box kicks with Jameson Gibson Park. Yes, you do. I suppose maybe a better way of asking the question, do you think there's a high-scoring affair? Um, I don't think teams tend to score a lot of points against us. I think, you know, a couple of tries each, um, maybe in the kind of in the 20s, but I don't see it being... Um, cricket score of any okay. sort. Now I think you'll oh, see. Yeah, no, nah, I don't see that. I think it'll be. There will be tries because both teams have such good attack, and you just can't thwart one another for eighty minutes when you're when you've got really good systems in place and you've got really skillful individuals. Yeah. So it does feel like both teams will get a couple of tries, but um, and then you know who keeps the scoreboard ticking over? Who does who does their job there? Um, but I think it'll be a definitely a one score game. 
definitely a one score game okay. um, and I think I think we might win I think we might I think be, just on what I said about the Rook I heard um, Rafa be, uh, even as saying um, that discipline will be key did we give away three penalties against Wales and they gave away certainly 14 at last count against I think, Italy I think we might have crept up to did we, yeah? six oh, did we go that high okay when, but, last, when I was looking at it, it was two like at 64 yeah, two or three minutes. None until the 54th minute. Right, okay, okay, right. Which is, which is well, when the game was well, over, anyway. There you go. Wildly inaccurate. But um, but I, I, that will be important, but I think that the accuracy around Rook will be the the point of difference for for Ireland if France didn't weren't to focus on it and didn't think, oh, no, we're fine. What we did against Italy will suffice against Ireland. It won't. Let's circle back to something else you said. So uh, Johnny Sexton may or may not play the full 80. Joey Carberry will invariably then have to come on and, and, and do something. You said you didn't. There was a, a disparity between what they both produced on Saturday. Yeah, I think Joey doesn't have that much um, experience playing in this team as well. So I, I, I'm always mindful of of cutting someone some slack. I, I don't think he's the ten that Johnny is, and I don't think he ever will be able to read it the same way and play the way we've come accustomed to. I think we've got a really unique individual in that. Yeah. And I, I'll, until Johnny hangs up his boots, there's a strong likelihood I will continue to say that. Um, because I've watched his game grow and scrutinised it, and he, he just sees it clearer than most players. Um, so his understanding of how long to hold on to a ball, when to throw the pass, you know, who to give the eyes to, and when to choose and he doesn't get it right 100% of the time but he gets it right 85 or 90% of the time the di- that, that squaring up around the corner is key to this shape and just a few times Joey you know ended up running across the field r- and which what what forces the players outside him to struggle to be able to pick a line off him by Sexton squaring up if you were running a line into a particular space and then Johnny sec- uh, Johnny squares up would well, Doris and Van der Fleer, they all modify their line to run to the outside shoulder of the defender that mm. that he's now fixed. And why 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 would Joey Carberry be is crabbing the face sometimes he, he, across sorry, the pitch? He, why why sorry, would he be he doing cra- that? Yes, but he did it really well once or twice. Okay, it's just a matter of being consistent. He was it wasn't like he did it for the fifteen minutes that he was on. Once or twice did a really good job. At one point, ring rose he put into space and he nudged the ball through a really good kick which Ireland, you know, forced the turnover, forced the line out. Yeah. Really good outcome. So there was some good stuff, but I just think considerably inconsistent comparatively to to um, to Johnny. And and that will come with how much how much time is he getting on the ball throughout the week? How much game time does he get? Like it's it's I'm sure Johnny's inviting him in oh, all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. Tens are good like that. They <laughs> want Oh you here I I, I want to rest my old legs up. You come in here and <laughs> look and really good. Have okay. a go, have a go for a while and pull this defense apart. And I guess as well, I mean there is such a comfort level for Sexton surrounded by Leinster teammates in the main and Carberry's coming in to as you said a few more unfamiliar faces. Yeah, and and, and it's it's a newer system no matter how long they're at it you, you have to remember too that the, the international rugby they're not together that long sure seven seven eight weeks um over the course of six nations a tour november mm. whereas when you're at it day in day out for a club it it does considerably help help your system to understand the angles of running and um, the timing what individuals like to do yeah what their you know what their habits are, what way they, they tweak and modify their game to, to manipulate defences. And when you're playing with someone like Johnny and get an understanding for that, it's going to be easier than someone like Joey that comes into that environment and for players to work off him and read him. And that's just a time thing. Mm. Quick word on Matt Hansen. Yeah, so impressed, really impressed. It, it would have been so easy for him to go first cap, kind of came a lot sooner than maybe he would have considered it to be the case um, and it's like okay I've got to prove myself Yeah, but talk about playing a really really mature um, role um, he he was lucky in that he fortuitously he got a touch of the ball in the first minute or two mm. and ran 40 or 50 metres good kick in field pressure ball in hand I've you know stats are looking good already I've, I've, barely, I've barely started yeah, that got the, I got the flowing locks yeah. going you know <laughs> 
Um, but all of the other parts to his game were really good. The square up for for Gary's try. Um, and he where, comes where off he, his where, wing. Again, that, that, that so he, many, he comes off his wing. Yeah, so Johnny section, yeah. works back. He, he reads it and plays off him. So it's transition. Porter rips the ball out, out of a tackle. Keller links with Johnny and... Um, and Hansen immediately sees opportunity, transition, defence to attack, plays off him, runs an arc, but then squares up. And that's what I'm talking about, the square up that, that you know, Johnny and the other guys yes. that I mentioned, Mac gets it, of understanding around the corner, commit shoulders in, give the pass. Bundy then throws a beautiful pass to Gary out in front of him and it's try time yeah. for the, from the second he catches it. So... Um, those small little mature things not overplaying his hand not going gosh I've got a, I'm a winger I've got to carry don't you know carry when the opportunity arises mm. play make when, it, when it's your time and that's what he did for Bundy's first try yes, lovely okay. floated pass working hard off his wing so um, yeah really really I, I, there was no fear in him He's, he was the sort of player that you felt would comfortably fit into the into the environment and I think I need to see a little bit more of him defensively. I think he's proficient defensively without being outstanding, but um, he'll he'll have sterner tests than he has had. But I'll be interested. I'll be kind of keeping an eye on that. But from an intellect point of view and going forward, I was super impressed with him. Okay, so final word on Ireland France. Uh, you've you've spooked me by going for Ireland to win in Paris against this brilliant team by one so. point, by two points. Yeah, S- super tight. Yeah, really tight. And listen, we could lose it, of course we could. And um, are they a ca- team capable of beating us by eight or ten? Of course they are, what they did in November. Um, they've had a really bad run-in to, um, mm. to the Six Nations. My understanding is they were only got into camp for the first time on Monday. A lot of them were playing for their clubs last weekend. You're going to be a bit rusty. They'll be better for the first game. And an international at that, blow out the cobweb. So they'll be a lot better. Um, in in the second game, but it'll be it'll be fireworks. It'll yeah. be a great 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 game. I'm really looking forward. To, I haven't looked forward to a game like this for some time. And um, yeah, I, I just think without getting ahead of ourselves because it is one game one, but it's it's one game one on the back of three really good performances and and a and a real clarity. But teams now have to find a way to upset Ireland. They've got to find. Uh, an Achilles heel and, and, and they'll, they'll realise in the past that it's been their struggles with physicality with, mm-hmm. with being dominated up front in the collision zone and if they can get you know, the upper hand in that area it'll be interesting to see what shape Ireland are able to contribute um, will it be well, at the moment a lot of it's very front foot ball whereas on the back foot, let's see what that shape looks like. And so that will be a real focus of France to make sure that they they give difficult possession and slower possession. Can't have three-second rooks. No team in the world can defend the three-second rooks. OK. Our rugby coverage on Off the Ball is with thanks to Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. A quick final word from Brian O'Driscoll on Scotland 20, England 17. So the Scots deliver and win the Calcutta Cup again. First time they've beaten England twice in a row since 1984. They're in Cardiff next weekend, which is a really interesting litmus mm. test. As for England, in some ways they're the bigger talking point because Eddie Jones pre-tournament had been talking about how this was his third team of his tenure and he was picking a more mobile pack and Marcus Smith was in a 10 and I I was really thinking, well, we're going to see some running rugby and some attacking flair and what's Jones going to unleash on us now? it It was hard to understand what they were doing. They kicked the ball away every time it came near them. Even though they dominated possession, they just kept kicking it away. Uh, there just seemed to be no flow mm. in all the you know everything we said about Ireland and the flow to their play England looks so stodgy yeah they did look they looked I saw Martin Johnson refer to it as clunky and I, I think that is it in a nutshell um, they did they they looked like a version of Ireland in last year's Six Nations <laughs> right. that's exactly what they looked like okay. just timing a little bit off um, understanding of what they were trying to do game plan but um they're, you know what are they the best at? What have, what did England? What have England had success with over the last number of years, decades? In fact, um, being collision winners, mm. winning advantage line. Sometimes quite a simple game plan, a little bit more elaborate in the World Cup um, in Japan. It was it was pretty nice stuff that they were playing. They kind of matched the physical with yeah. some pretty silky skills, and that was 
that was a new side to an English team that that I hadn't seen for quite some time. You know, to play with that level of of attacking prowess. Um, but it feels like they've definitely reverted to um, or regressed rather than reverted. They've they yeah. It, it looks. Do you know what? It it shows how important someone like um, Owen Farrell is in their environment. Right. I think they're. They're lacking leadership in there. I think no Courtney Laws, um, no Owen Farrell. There's big. They're big players for them. Um, even no Underhill. Um, it's it's mad that Atoji's not seen as captaincy material. We saw what what um, what Eddie Jones said about him um, in his book. You know about him kind of relative, pretty much summing up saying he's kind of more self centered than than captaincy material sent him to acting lessons so so when you look at a player of his caliber and mm. um, but yet he's not perceived to be a, a leader within their environment you kind of wonder you know where are they going to generate a world cup challenging team from here it's a long time sure. to the world cup i'm not saying they're spent force far from it but they have a lot of work to do and a lot of ground to make up. They'll still be bloody hard when we play them in Twickenham in a few thing, weeks. Two because laggy, they're still England. And two laggy played at the weekend, so he they're might be... still England and they're still prou- proud and they're still big specimens, physical. If they if they play fast and um, and aggressive, you know, that that is a game that we've struggled with. So I know we'll come to that in, in a few weeks' time. Yeah. We won't get ahead of ourselves. But it, it did feel as though they... They had opportunities too. They really did. They could have put you know, Scotland away. What did you make of Marcus Smith? Um, yeah, I like. In in parts, I thought was pretty impressed. You know, took his try brilliantly well. Mm. Um, goal kicked pretty well. Um, I wonder, you know, would he benefit from, you know, from a big voice like Farrell playing beside him? I, the sense is he would. Which was the plan. Yeah, the sense is he he would because you don't want to take away all of that, all of what has gotten them to where he's gotten but you do need a slightly different game internationally you won't have the space and the ability to go yourself and be Roy the Rovers like he has been for for Harlequins that's not what Test Match Rugby is about Mm. so but yet still pretty impressed and a bit puzzled like most people about him being withdrawn when he he did it it felt like a bit of a preordained decision but um yeah, I think for a, for a first Six Nations start, you know, p- pretty good. Yeah, and a final word on Scotland. They are feeling very excited about this team. I mean, th- th- this team is now of an age where if it's not now that they do something, i.e. really push for a championship, it's going to be never because some of their marquee names will soon be mm. on the slide. So this year is as likely as any year, I suppose. They're in Cardiff on Saturday. Yeah, the, the question has always been in the last 20 years has been the platform that they, they've had qu- quite good backs, quite talented backs but to give them the front football that other teams have, have been given and um, and I think they you know, they didn't have all of the possession at the weekend but the, some of the quality of what they delivered was really good they've got some very, very good finishers um, and not just the guys that played, you, you still have Cam Redpath to, mm. to come back um, you know you've um, you've got players playing very very confidently in Finn Russell um, I, I just think that they need to build the confidence themselves too because they have they're part of our group in the World Cup too and two of two of, of that three only qualify of us South Africa and them and they've got to try and go and win a championship to put a screw in our heads that they are absolute contenders to to not be the one to be left packing their bags after after the group stage so a, a championship or more regular victories or contesting the final weekend coming over to Ireland and denying us a championship all of those things will count in the bigger picture of of going to the to rugby world cup in France so it, it's another subplot within the tournament yeah Sorry, I'm trying to lie. I'm just thinking of um, Jamie Heaslip's fist pump when Scotland came out. <laughs> 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 so, uh, not to have that situation, I suppose, is, is what they're trying to do. Uh, listen, great stuff. I mean, bring on Saturday. It's going to be great. Brian Driscoll, thanks so much. Cheers, Joe. Brian O'Driscoll on Off the Ball with Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us.